This is NHTV2, North Haven Government Television, a service of North Haven Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of North Haven. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our January Board of Selectmen meeting. A happy and healthy new year to everyone watching and everyone here, to you and your families. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to ask everyone to stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item number two, any public comments to tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, we'll move to item number three, the approval of the Board of Selectmen meeting minutes from December 7th. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. Um, I'll second uh, um, that motion by Sally. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for that vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Item number four, approval of the special board of selectmen meeting, which happened on December 19th. I'll motion to approve those minutes. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for that vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number five, we will dispense with that tonight. We'll have future updates probably at the February meeting. Item number six, I'd like to talk about this uh, and how it started. So for those of you that don't have an agenda, let me read this. Item number six, discussion of the possibility of adopting an ordinance to provide a tax abatement for retail property taxes for the surviving spouses of police officers and firefighters who died while in the line of duty. So I've provided Sally and Bill a draft ordinance. I'd like to explain that the origin of this started last year after the passing of Officer Dustin DeMonte of the Bristol Police Department. Dustin and his family, Dustin was a resident of North Haven, his family still lives in North Haven. So the Bristol D Police Department, whom I've established a very close relationship with, called me and asked me if we would consider supporting an existing state statute on the books. That state statute reads as State Statute 12 81. 81X. 81X. So the family approached me and I explained that sometimes creating ordinances takes a while, it's a process. So flash forward to tonight. Before the first of the year, our town attorney came up with a draft ordinance. Our goal tonight is to have discussion, Sally, Bill, myself, in public, to get some feedback to the ordinance. Once we come up with some tweaks or changes, I'll bring that back to the town attorney for his review. My goal is at the February meeting here to then call for a town meeting. Because when we create an ordinance, it has to go to a public vote at a town meeting. And I'll be up there presenting the ordinance at the town meeting once we warn the town meeting. When I say warn, I mean call for the town meeting. Which will either be here or at the North Haven High School. That's yet to be determined. And uh, we will then, as a town, vote on this. Uh, several municipalities do have this. And I was unaware of the statute that grants the municipality the option of doing this. So that is the purpose of this item on the agenda. I know Sally and Bill have had a chance to read it. I'd be interested in your in your points of view. Yeah, the, um, and Sally, you probably had the same reaction. You know, uh, uh, even before Mike prefaced his comments or came up with his comments tonight and prefaced our discussion of this that if you look at the um, uh, on the first page there uh, it's the under definitions it's the one two three four fifth paragraph it said located within the geographical boundaries of the town of Port Haven um, 
I felt that that you know, if you know that to to actually include her and her family, it should be um, the geographical boundaries of the state of Connecticut, so that any police officer or fireman whose family lives in North Haven would be covered by this um, you know this property tax abatement. Right. Um, well, first, I want to say that I am in support of this, but I do have some suggestions and, and tweaks here. I'm a little disappointed that the town attorney is, is, is not here. I did read other sample ordinances from four other municipalities to get an idea of what other towns have done with this. Ours seems to be very similar to um, Groton. And the, the, the main differences are, um, and first of all, everybody has to understand this is for real estate taxes only. That's right. The ordinance, uh, excuse me, the um, statute, Connecticut General Statute, um, only mentions real estate, real property taxes, right. so it doesn't affect car taxes right. or personal property taxes if they own, own a business. Uh, so we have to be very careful to understand this is real estate taxes only, and obviously um, uh, the first responder who has tragically passed away has to have lived in North Haven. We don't have any, many, I'm sure there are more than a few of our own police officers and firefighters who serve the town of North Haven but don't live here. So, you know, we, yeah. we can't control what right. the town where they live does. So right. it only applies to first responders who, who, who live in North Haven. Right. We only have the authority to abate. Uh, an abatement is a temporary suspension we only have the authority to abate our own taxes. Right. So my goal after reading this, one of my topics is similar to right. Bill. I wanted it, because if you read under the definitions, and I believe it was paragraph four, which defines police officer, and paragraph two defines firefighter, I found both um, very hard to dissect, um, and um, but let's stick with the police officer, police officer for first. It says police officer means a duly sworn member of a municipal police department, serving in an official capacity, full time or part time, with compensation, or and that's very important. That little tiny word, or a duly sworn member of the town police department serving in the town in official capacity, full or part-time, for any valid police department located within the geographic boundaries of the town of North Haven. So if when I read that, I, it seems to conflict itself. First it says it's a duly sworn member of a municipal police department, which is what I want. I want the um, Duponti situation to apply. So I want the police officer to be defined as any police officer serving in any municipal town. But when it goes on. It kind of contradicts itself. Yes, it goes on. Which is what I was trying to, to say as well. To say um, for any valid police department located within the geographic boundaries of the town of North Haven. So if town council was here tonight, my first question on the top of my list of questions was, is it for, um, in town or out of town, what you know? It, it, this is very conflicting. All right. So here's here's the answer. In the case of Officer DeMonte, yep. he was a member of a municipal police department mm -hmm. in Bristol. He right. lived in North Haven. Yep. That language is put in there to define that if we have an officer who lives in North Haven, and God forbid passes away because he in an, in a, in another town or city because he's working for that police department. Yeah. So that covers the Bristol situation. This other language was put in to say that in addition, that if, God forbid, a North Haven police officer passes away. So the distinction is the first sentence covers 
someone living in town who serves as a police officer for another agency that's not North Haven. Right. The second reference that you right. mentioned, Sally, mm -hmm. is to cover North Haven police officers who, God forbid, passed away. Right. Well, but it, it because it has the or in there, it, it, it looks like you have to, it's one or the other, and it just, I like the definition in the East Hampton um, ordinance, which says, instead of all of this, well, police officer means a duly sworn member of a certified police department or certified police agency serving in an official capacity, full or part time. So that covers any, any someone working for the town of North Haven Police Department mm -hmm. or the Bristol Police Department or any municipality and certified police agency, I think that's in there to include state police. Yeah, well that's, that part's true, yes, definitely. Um, yeah. I just think a broader definition, uh, uh, I, I was, as Bill was, I, I found this a little contradictory. Whereas the firefighter, and, and in this East Hampton one, the firefighter definition is almost the same. Um, the firefighter definition is one full swoop sentence. Firefighter means any person who is duly employed member of a municipal fire department and paid for the purpose of performing fire duties as part, um, duties full time or part time for any valid fire department located within the geographic boundaries of the town of North Haven. So again, that seems to be conflicting. Is it any municipality? It doesn't say any municipality, right. which normally it would. It says a municipal de fire department. But then the, the end of the sentence says, and there's, there's no or this time, it just says for any valid fire department located within North Haven. I think it's, it is conflicting, and I like the simpler definition in the East Hampton sample, and I also believe, and this is a major distinction, I also believe that it should include volunteer firefighters. Right. This does not. Next, right? yep. um, I think it's very important to include the volunteer fire department, um, the volunteers. This clearly says duly employed and paid. Right. Um, and so, the, our ordinance, as presented here, does not include the volunteers. I think that's a major, that was one of my biggest problems. The volunteers, fire um, fighters, risk their lives just as much as the paid, and we need to protect them as well. So I, that I, I was agree with the you on that problem too. I so. had with the definitions of okay. firefighter and police officer. They seem inconsistent, or I shouldn't say inconsistent, they seem contradictory. Um, and uh, I think a simpler definition of a police officer and firefighter is just someone who is employed, let me read the firefighter in the one I like. Firefighter means any person who is duly employed, paid, or volunteer member of a municipal fire department for the purpose of performing fire duties, full-time or part-time, for any valid fire department. That's what I like. All right, let's put that language in, because I agree with that. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I do too. I yeah. like, uh, and I mean, I could. Uh, send this to you, or after ECM. the meeting, uh, you could copy it. <coughs> but these yeah. are the definitions for firefighter and police officer that I prefer. They are not arguably contradictory. They clearly will include officers um, who work for other police departments, but of course, they have to live in North Haven. Have in North Haven. Everybody has to live in North Haven. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, but again, not all North Haven police department or fire department people will be covered by this because, yeah, because they don't live here. They don't live here. Yeah. So Bill, are you in agreement? Oh, I oh yeah. This, because okay. I, yeah, I think Sally's bringing up the same point okay. that, that I was mean? regarding and, police. Um, and so that was we, my... F before we go from police though, yeah. Um, you know, we do have school resource officers, yeah. supernumerary. Should we, should we include them in that definition? I, I think so. Yeah. So you know, it, it seems like again, um, 
And I know we've made distinctions over time, in, you know, between supernumeraries and school resource officers. Right. Um, but but again, they even though you know even though I, I'm sure I'm not sure that the definition would the way it's written would include them. Um, right. Because they're really not truly employed, and they're you know re retired police officers, but they are performing a police duty for us in the school. Well, I think they're they are certified though. I know. So. So and I don't they're know duly sworn, but we could mention them. Qualify. I mean, technically, I mean, the ordinance that created that program is called the supernumerary right. program. Um, so that's why they are supernumeraries rather than uh, SROs right. that they are commonly referred to as um, in in conversation, budgetary, and otherwise. Um, but. Um, I think we're trying to make the definition clear. Yeah, so and, we uh, could say I, police I officer means a duly sworn member of a certified police department, including supernumeraries, on or a certified police agency serving um, in an official capacity, full or part time. Because I think we have to make it clear that we want to include residents of the town who work for other. Police department. Yes, so that was the intention of this. Yeah. So well, we'll sharpen I'm, up the language. Yeah, I don't okay. find it. Oh, we're going to sharpen up the language. Yes, so great. we're going to put the language in. Yes. We'll send it to Jeff. We're going to have Jeff here in February meeting and we'll, and we'll finalize this. Yes. I'd like to direct your attention to section G. Yes. Because this is also ambiguous. All right. So. Um, about remarrying? No, section G talks about the federal poverty level for income. Oh, where? Mm -hmm. I said this is the next page, section G. See it right there, okay. That's H. Okay. No, I'm talking about G right here, G. It's actually H. It's yeah. H. <laughs> it's kind of run together. Yeah, okay. oh, F, G, well, I'm looking see, at G. G says a surviving yeah. spouse remarries. Right, but I'm. But I'm, H is, see the, the H yeah, there? Yeah, they, they're in front on top of, of In each order, other. yeah. So we know what it is. There should be a space. There's, There's be a no space, space. right. Okay, so, we'll have a space there. So. H, yeah. What this says is that um, yeah. that, it, that the surviving spouse cannot earn more than 400% um, of poverty level for a single person. Now, in the case of our two public safety people who passed away in the line of duty, one is a firefighter, one, of course, is the police officer we're talking about, um, they're not families of one. So this is a little bit unfair. Because the federal poverty level for a, for a family of one is like $14,500, which means that at 400%, you're looking at like $57,000 in income maximum, which if you make more than that, you're disqualified. So I think that this language has to include the fact that it's um, not relegated to just a single family one. Family well, one. Those, those guidelines which are used um, by the IRS uh, in, um, in certain um, um, forms that you have to file and, and um, um, I believe has a separate category for family with two to well, here, three. Here's yeah. the guidelines. Okay, we, so, we have the guidelines. Yeah, right. oh, but so this is a single-person right. family yeah. household. Yeah, so, right. so, so for children in the family, that is not a single-person family that, household. That's right. my point. That's what right. I'm saying. So we so could change they, it. Right. Right. Well, right. I was going to talk about the income. The criteria. Yeah. Yeah. What, so, doesn't, doesn't it go have different uh, yeah, so different size families? Exactly. So that's what we want to adopt, this chart into this so okay. that if uh, if there's a spouse that has three children it's a family of four not a family of one yeah okay so um, well or family whatever is applicable right whatever whatever the, the whatever the household is yeah the size the in terms of dependents the other question that i was going to ask about the income restriction because uh, again I, i've read four plus ours is five and two out of the five have income restrictions the other three do not so it is a question for, I think, the town meeting. Do we want a restriction at all? That's a valid point. We should look at that. But certainly, if we want, because um, some municipalities do not. So if we're going to have a, um, an income restriction, I definitely agree with you that we have to change that single person family line. Yeah. So it's. 
It's either or, right? It's either, either or. Either the chart or, the, or, or no. Or none. None, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So here's what I'd like to do. Because tonight was just discussion. It was a good discussion. We made some changes. Uh, Valerie took some notes. And Sally, feel free to give, uh, to give Valerie that, what you have. There, yes, right? I will. I, I just want to talk about a couple of other things, um, if, if you don't mind. Um, where's my list? Hold on a second. Um, all right, we did this one. Um, now, some we we want to uh, obviously, if we are trying to make this apply to situations that have already occurred. Yeah. I think there has to be some retroactive language in there, even though it says something about um, uh, um, the grand list date, of, um, which we have to fill in because mm -hmm. it's blank. Right. Um, a couple of these, you know, talk about um, it only applies to deaths occurring after the adoption an approval of the abatement program. Um, you know, so there has, uh, usually when an ordinance right. is passed, it never, it, it doesn't go backwards in time. Yeah, so I've spoken to the families. But we could have retroactive language. We're, we're free to do that right. under 12-81X. Right. The families understand that if this passes, and it's my intention to pass this, because I support it, yep. that it would start in the grand list starting July 1st. So. I guess we do have the option to make it retroactive, but the families right now are very grateful that I'm moving forward with this, so, as a, and on behalf of the town. Or is your point retroactive in the passing of the officer? Uh, that's yeah, what that's I'm talking about, right. the passing right. of the Not officer. Not necessarily the town. Right, I understand that it, it will, right. the, the abatement can't go back in time. Right. And uh, it would be the October. Um, the grand list is always October 1st. Right. July 1st is the first day of the fiscal year. Um, so it, um, I'm not talking about the effective date of when the abatement can begin, but the, the retroactivity for the, the, the death occurring. So take I me through we, it, because I'm not need, quite sure I understand what you're saying. So take me through it. Well, I, I just think that, that we the, need to the, be clear that this could apply right. to uh, the, two we, the two we had have actually already passed away. Yeah, you know, and and within a certain amount right. of time. It's but but, but take, take me through again the retroactive point you're making. Well, uh, as I said, I've seen in, in other um, uh, in other um, sample ordinances, for example, in Greenwich, they say that um, there you had to be employed only by the town, which I didn't like. Um, employed by the town who dies on or after the date of approval of this resolution. Um, so we don't want any assumption that normally a, a law and an ordinance is like a law doesn't apply to retroactive right. occurrences. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as you, you your opening remark said, this really started because of your discussion with the Bristol right. Police Department with. Um, an officer who served another town, but who lived in North Haven at the time of yep. his death. And so we want it to apply to him and a retro, even though his death occurred prior to the adoption. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. Well, that's the intention of this. If we have to put language in on that, we can do that. I that's get what it. I'm I saying. Totally I get it. Yeah. I get it. I th thank you, Val. I yep. think that um, we want to, to, to do some, side, some sort of retroactive language. Um, and I did have a question about so, uh, the Sally, but that would also then, you know, I'm, I would object, I would not object to that either. If there, if a family then moved um, the, the spouse of another deceased uh, firefighter or police officer um, who died in the line of duty moved to North Haven, um, then they would also be included under this ordinance in terms well, of the. Well, that's the next question I have here, which is. They have to be a resident at the time of death. Right. So you don't want 
people moving here to, to get the abatement. Um, I understand, yeah. So I think we need it retroactive with maybe a two-year limitation on that retroactivity. Right. I get that, too. Yeah. I don't know uh, if we've had any other deaths. No, we haven't. But it makes sense what you're saying. That does. So We did have a police officer die in the line of duty in 1980. Yeah. Right. Yes. Laughing, right. Yeah. right. But anyway, uh, I, I think we could do a retroactivity with a, a, a two-year limit. Um, and also, um, just to be clear that we're including, you know, um, and then, of course, the abatement will, will come into effect at the grand list the that grand we fill in, right. even though the death happened prior. But I think we do need language that the officer and the surviving spouse have to be a resident at the time of death because we are including any police officer in any municipality. Okay? There's a lot of municipalities in town, in, in the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So if we're including all police officers in all municipalities, I think we definitely need language who, where they were residents of North Haven. Okay, now that, you don't see that in here? Or I no, see no, it? you could, that wouldn't be, that could either be in the definition of firefighter or it could be in um, um, section B where we actually establish the abatement. All right, because you know, this is written, surviving spouse means the person who was a resident of the town of North Haven and married to the police officer or firefighter at the time of the police officer or firefighter's passing death. Okay. It says that here. Okay. Surviving hmm. spouse. Okay, so that should, I guess that would assume that the fire, uh, the, the, that the police officer is also a resident at the time of death. Right. Yeah, because it says, means the person who was a resident. Yeah, okay. the surviving spouse right. means the person who was a resident of the town of North Haven and married to the police officer or firefighter right. at the time of the police or firefighter's death. Yes. Right, but what I've seen in others is if you go to B, where it actually says the abate abatement, um, 100% abate, uh, abatement um, with respect to real property owned by the surviving spouse of a firefighter or police officer who has died, I think that should be in the line of duty, um, as a result of the performance of his or her duty as a police or officer or firefighter and who was a resident of the town of North Haven at the time. That's where I've seen the, the language there in that paragraph. All of the ordinances that I've seen have a, a very similar paragraph like, like B. All right, so we can augment that language to Yes, to I think it just further, yeah. it just further clarifies that, yeah. So that the, the spouse and the, fire and the first responder have to be residents of right. North that Haven. That just qualifies, I think further clarifies it. That's yes, so I, it does. That's, that's where I, I would agree with you too. And um, the, I guess the only other issue, I like the 100% um, abatement, but I should make a note uh, that um, some towns that include police officers and firefighters in all municipalities, not just who work for their own, um, as a trade-off, um, have it at 50% like in Cromwell and um, Greenwich has, Groton has 100%. So, the, you know, there's that option also because the statute 12-81X says all or part, but personally I like the 100%. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm okay. Yeah, I have no, I'm I had no intention of reducing yeah. it to 50%. I, okay, yeah. good. I just, I'm saying from my, my research, I saw yeah. when you trade off and include all first responders from all municipalities, it seemed to have that as a trade off. Yeah, okay. But I think I like the 100%. Um, I just mentioned it because I like to give people options to yeah. think about. Bill, you're on board with 100%. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. I, I am too. 
So I think this is a great thing, and I'm glad that we're, most importantly, uh, clarifying the, the, the definition and uh, essentially of, of essential importance, including the um, uh, volunteer firefighters. Absolutely. I think that's key. All right. Okay. So we'll have, so we'll thank ha you. We yep. will have the uh, new draft available. We'll yes. send it out to both of you in advance yes. of that meeting, and then so you can come forward. We'll bring Jeff here, and my, my goal is to wrap this up, present it right. to a town meeting, and get and see if we can get the public to approve it. And it should say in B, in the line of duty, because line of duty is defined, and all it says is on duty. I yeah, think, yeah, we made yeah. that. Yes, oh, you yeah. got that. I'm got sorry. That, yeah. I, I just mentioned it while I was reading yep. it. I know. Okay, yeah, heading, thank you very much. The heading much. has line of duty correct. Uh huh? I think the heading is kind of correct, but I, I think line of duty is a better a better term. Yeah, well, it's line of duty is defined, but right. then it's never used. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think we need to match the, the definition. So um, let me just look at my list of questions that's that's about it thank you very much excellent okay, okay. sally just just i was going to ask your opinion on um yeah. you know, there's the i think correctly if if it was a multi-family arrangement there's a proration you know in terms of the abatement only applying to the which section are you in property that um which section so letter the right the right section now uh, let's see for the abatement or the proration section. It's on the second page. F? Yeah, F there. There's a proration section in F. Yeah, I don't think that's for a multi family. Um, it says if the oh, fractional portion of such qualifying spouse uh, properties a multi family or multiple use dwelling. Such relief be prorated to reflect the fractional portion of such okay, okay. property occupied by the qualifying spouse. Okay. Um, I was reading up above, in any case, where properties recorded in the name of a spouse and other people. Sometimes people add their kids to the title or, right. or, or someone else. And it says that it would be prorated to reflect the fractional portion of the qualifying spouse. So if if after qualifying for the abatement, um, she does a quit claim deed, putting it in, he or she puts it in um, her name plus someone else, that would affect the um, fractional portion that would qualify. Or create a fractional portion. Yes. Yep. So if it's two people, I guess only half would, would yep. apply. Yeah. But then it says, okay, if such property is a multiple family or multiple use dwelling, such relief will be prorated. No, no, that's tough. That's going to be up to the assessor to determine. Yes. So a multiple use meaning um, a business underneath, an apartment yeah. up top. Mm. That gets a little tricky, but yeah. that's kind of the way, you know, the, yeah. the statute is written. So. It's for a primary residence, yes, so there would have to be some sort of way of, that would be a tough thing for the assessor to do, but determine what portion of the entire dwelling is for residential and what yep. is for another use, and then prorate it accordingly, and then the abatement yep. would be for that residential use only. That's, That's how right. I read that. Yeah, right. exactly right. See, okay. and, and, to, and I think you said the key word, if I go back to B on the first page. B, yeah. Um, you know, where it says municipal real estate, um, residential property taxes. And I think they're still mm -hmm. technically residential, um, but I think you said owner-occupied. So that almost like, you know, I think we're at, even here, we should clearly indicate owner-occupied under I B. I think it also applies to like if it was a two-family residence and the, the spouse is living on the first floor and you're renting yeah. out the second floor, they're saying you would only, that, that would be yeah. prorated to just, right. that's exactly you know, right. so it wouldn't necessarily okay. be see, I just think it's business. very general under right. B where, you know, right. I think even under B we'd want to say, because it, it just says municipal real estate residential property taxes due with respect to real property owned by the surviving spouse. Um, well, you know, but it would only apply if it was owner-occupied 
on property. Well, so even if, there, you, I'd if you're to, saying residential, it would have to be in an R something zone. Yeah. And a, a multiple use might not be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yet it's still the spouse's so primary I, I, residence. Right. So I think we want owner, I think we want it to be owner occupied in either well, Absolutely. Yeah. And that, it, 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 as opposed to just residential. As a primary, um, primary residence, that is. Or primary residence is also another way of phrasing it. Yes. But under B, I think we just talked about residential property. And it could be a residential property, but it may not be occupied by the spouse. Okay. So, you, so, but I, you know, so I think either maybe owner occupied or primary residence of the. Yes, the assessor has quite a few duties in, in here. Right. So that would be um, one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, so we have a game plan for February. We'll send out the new draft beforehand. Great. Okay. We'll try to get, get that out 10 days in advance for Sally and Bill, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk to Jeff on that. Sure. Thank Very you. Very good. Okay. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you. All righty. All right. I'll turn this over to Bill and Sally for 7, 8, and so forth. Yes. Uh, 7, we are to consider and act upon a resolution authorizing the sale and disposal of fire department vehicles. So this is something that we customarily yeah. do. <clears throat> As it a is. board? It is. Mm -hmm. So just for the public, those watching, when we have vehicles that have aged out, we put them out to auction. We usually get a pretty decent sum for these vehicles, and the money goes back in the general fund. So number seven identifies the objective, and number eight, where we would like to read it, is the actual sure. resolution. I'll, I'll read it. I, <clears throat> Val, um, I have to do the VIN number, don't I? I, <laughs> I usually have in the past. Yeah. All right. Okay. If you don't mind. So, because um, that's the identification of the vehicle. Yes, really. I'll make this motion. Resolve that the town of North Haven authorize the auction and disposal of the following surplus fire department vehicles. The director of procurement and administration, Richard Monaco, is authorized to determine acceptable bid offers and or take said equipment vehicles to alternate auction locations. All revenue received will return to the town's general fund. And we have a 2011 Ford Crown Victoria, Victoria four-door sedan. VIN number, here we go, 2FABP7BV7BX119444. And we have a 1987 Pierce Lance four-door VIN number 1P9CT02D7HA040155. The Pierce vehicle ID is E3521. I will make a motion for that resolution as read. I'll All second. Right. All right. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Bill Sally, go right ahead. Uh, next one is um, item on the agenda is resignations and appointments. I'll make a motion uh, for the appointment of Kathleen Fox, 14 Highland Drive. Is an alternate on the Inland Wetlands Commission for a four year term to expire December 31st, 2027. I'll second that. Kathleen is here and we're happy uh, uh, to have reviewed her uh, resume and uh, very experienced. I'm sure she'll do a great job. All right, Kathleen, thank you very much for your willing, willingness to serve. So we um, have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have the appointment of Carrie Maddy, 6 House Street, as an alternate on the Planning and Zoning Commission to fill the unexpired term of Roderick Williams, expiring on November 30th, 2025. Um, I'll second um, Carrie's appointment. All right. Uh, Carrie, if you're watching, thank you very much. We've worked closely together down through the years. I appreciate your willingness to serve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'll make a motion uh, for the appointment of Lori Jane Hannon, 26 Highland Park Road, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Board of Finance for a one-year term to expire December 31st, 2024. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. 
We have, I will make the motion for reappointment of Sandra Stetson, 542 Middletown Avenue, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Conservation Commission for a one-year term to expire December 31st, 2024. I'll second Sandra's reappointment. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I'll motion uh, for the reappointment of Mary Lou Stamp, 134 Middletown Avenue, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Parks and Recreation Commission for a one-year term to expire December 31st, 2024. Second. All right, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, <coughs> where are we? Brian. Brian. And Brian. I'll make a motion for the reappointment of Brian Cummings, 107 Clintonville Road, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission for a one year term to expire December 31st, 2024. I'll second um, that reappointment. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll motion for the reappointment of Mark uh, Cofrancesco, uh, <coughs> Six Ross Drive the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Land Trust for a one-year term to expire December 31st, 2024. Second. All right, motion second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I'll make a motion for the reappointment of Cheryl Ann Junowitz, 101 Knollwood Road, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the Inland Wetlands Commission for a one-year term to expire December 31st, 2024. I'll second um, uh, her reappointment. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and then I'll uh, make a motion for the reappointment of Stephen J. Fitzgerald, 34 River Road, to the Open Space Advisory Committee with the recommendation of the first selectman for a one year term to expire December 31st, 2024. Second. All right, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 10 is our property <coughs> tax refunds, and I'll make a motion to approve the refunds listed in the agenda. Um, I'll second um, uh, Sally's motion for those property tax refunds. All right, very good. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. It takes us, ladies and gentlemen, to item number 11, that the next regular meeting of this board will be Thursday, February 1st, here at the upstairs conference room at North Haven Memorial Town Hall. Item number 12, we're at the point, public comment. Mary White. <coughs> Mary White, Summer Lane, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I am here to share information and to make a request. First, the request. I ask residents to attend the Inland Wetlands Commission meeting on Wednesday, January 24 at the Rec Center at 7 p.m. Why attend? There is a public hearing that has been continued for 250 Universal Drive for a special permit to conduct regulated activity. Why care about that? The activity being proposed will lead to much destruction of wetlands, buffers, watercourses, marshes, as well as some animals on the property. This special permit is no ordinary special permit. The applicants are two civilians, a lawyer and a business owner. Both are not in the environmental contamination industry. They have an option to buy the property from the estates of the owners, but need the special permit approval first. The large property is about 100 acres. 60% or more of the site is a landfill filled with toxic and hazardous waste. Buried down 14 feet is industrial waste, household waste, metal scrap, creosote suit soaked railroad ties, solid waste, tires, ash, slag layers, thousands of drums buried and on top associated with the creosote plant, plus there are unknown sources. Of fill. What do they want to do if granted the special permit? It was said this is one of the largest toxic projects to deal with 
bigger than the tire pond. The applicant stated they will cover the toxic and hazardous waste by filling in the site, except for number 17, the Chuck and Eddie's area. How are they going to fill the site? They want to bring in 600,000 cubic yards of toxic contaminated fill, which will destroy 2,200 square feet of wetlands, destroy 4.1 acres of upland wetlands review areas, which include wetlands, destroy buffer zones, destroy marshes, which wetlands need, destroy animals such as deer, bears, and wildcats, which have been witnessed on the property by Wetlands Commission members, and they will negatively impact Eagle Crossing. They are doing no water quality testing. They plan to add drainage, pipes, swaleways, and toxic fill, which will all impact the wetlands. Where are they getting the 600,000 cubic yards of toxic contaminated fill? From dredging the New Haven Harbor, and after the state of Connecticut deems the toxic material is not too toxic. What happens if there is not enough toxic material from dredging the New Haven Harbor? I don't know. But there is always the New York Harbor where they dredge contaminated material daily. How will they get the 600,000 cubic yards of toxic contaminated <coughs> fill to the site? Exit 9 via 29,300 truckloads that will take two years to deliver. The public hearing was continued for several reasons. One of which is of the 100,000 test pits taken in the past and the 2,000 test pits taken in January 2023, which were tested for PCP using a grant, unknown were the pollutants, chemicals, toxins, and heavy metals on the site, in the wetlands, in the wetland upland review areas, and in the 600,000 cubic yards of toxic contaminated fill to be brought in. Some soils are so contaminated they were sent out to be studied. The scale of this toxic site is so enormous, and what is required to effectively remediate and maintain is extremely expensive, millions and millions of dollars. Plus, there is an imminent threat to the wetlands and the public. The applicant stated there is not enough money to bring it all out. Why is the site an imminent threat to the wetlands and the public's health and safety? It is due to the fact, should the tires catch fire, for example, like with the tire pond, the fire cannot be put out for years. The town of North Haven would have to be evacuated, as well as Hampton and surrounding towns, due to the fire easily spreading and water and foam being useless in extinguishing this type of fire. Tire fires produce oil when burned. The oil gets into the ground and seeps into the groundwater. Oil is highly flammable. Tire fires produce thick black smoke, which contains pollutants such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benzene, butadiene, and styrene. These toxins will get into the air we breathe. Recall, the applicants for the tire pond were the property owner who had abandoned the site and the government. I attended enough tire pond meetings to understand, one, they tried to remove the tires, but the equipment kept almost falling in, and so they were unable, not because there was not enough money. Two, they installed monitors and a monitoring system in the tire pond so the temperature of the tire pit is monitored and possibly the levels of anything emitted from the site to ensure they remain at acceptable levels. This wetland special permit application is the precursor to the applicant's incinerator plant idea, trash to energy facility, which would be a threat to the public's health and safety due to the fact 
the chimneys will be emitting air pollutants such as particulate matter, heavy metals, lead, mercury, toxic chemicals such as PAFAs, dioxins, forever chemicals that do not break down and are found in the environment. These chemicals and pollutants enter the air, water, and food supply near the incinerators and get into people's bodies by skin absorption when they breathe, drink, and eat contaminants. Why will, the, why will the character of the town of North Haven and our quality of life be destroyed? North Haven will become the trash incineration hub for the entire region. 25% of the state of Connecticut's trash will be coming into North Haven. The other 75% of trash will be coming into North Haven from New York, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, etc., from states in the region. Trash will be arriving and being incinerated 24-7, which means there will be a constant trash stench in North Haven. There will be a rats and raptors problem requiring pesticides and traps, and those rats and raptors will make their way off-site to nearby homes and businesses. The incinerators are hungry for trash. North Haven will literally stink and residents will come down with cancer from chemical and pollutant exposure, like people in close proximity to Upjohn, and thousands of wetlands will have been destroyed. The new names for North Haven will be Dump Haven and Trash Haven. To close, what can we do now to save our town? Attend the Inlands Wetlands Commission meeting on Wednesday, January 24th at 7 p.m. at the Rec Center and tell the commission to protect the wetlands and water courses by voting no to the special application. And one more thing, as always, call the Land Use Department on January 24th to verify the special permit application is still on the agenda. Opposition letters can be written to the commission via the land use administrator, Alan Fredrickson, at fredrickson.allen at town.north-haven.ct.us. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Sherman Katz. <coughs> yeah. Sherman Cats, 40 Sherwood Drive. Good evening. Good evening. Happy New Year. Knowing Mary White, she did a lot of research and she's usually pretty good and accurate at it. Uh, and I, I didn't realize that this was going on as bad as it was. Um, you want to create something that's worse than up, John, that took us uh, 20 years to get rid of. Now, I don't think I'm mistaken, but I read the article in the newspaper. Mike, you said you were in support of this project. Can You're you tell wrong. us why? You're wrong. I said I'm in support of allowing it to go to the regulatory processes. That is what I have to support. Okay. It's the regulatory bodies, wetlands and P&Z, that make the decision. That's what I said. Okay, I, I yes. misunderstood. So you're not stating that you're in favor or against it, right? I want, I want, as I said in the article, I want the people of North Haven to voice their opinion, ask the questions. Mr. Gamb Gambardella has uh, committed to answer every single question. The role of the chief elected official is not to stymie the process to prevent it from going to the regulatory bodies. It's going to be, in the end, the regulatory bodies who make the decision, like Mary was saying. That's why Mary said, go to the meeting, voice your opinion, send information in the land use. So now, the, the, the other thing that's going on here is the state is behind this. So that's why Mary's saying, go to the meeting. So I support it going through the processes so that the people could weigh in and offer their opinion. That's what I said. Okay. And quite often what's good for the state is not good for us. No, well, that's true. Uh, I want to ask about this uh, tax abatement. Are you talking about 100% tax abatement? For the property taxes, yes. For the for house taxes, taxes, yes. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Yes. I have the most respect 
utmost respect for the police and fire department. I've always supported the, 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 the personnel for raises and safety and all that stuff. But I have some questions. If a policeman is killed in a line of duty, his widow, does she receive his pension? Yes. Yeah, 100%? No, I think uh, the way it works, Sherman, depending upon the years of service that the public safety person has with the municipality, there's a, it's, it's prorated based on the years of service. Each year gets equated to a multiplier. That could be 2%, 2.5%. So it depends. The level of pension depends upon the years of service with the person in the department. Now, what we don't know sometimes is, is there a, uh, an additional supplement from Social Security with the federal government? That, I guess, is depending on each circumstance. Uh, I have a question about di uh, death in the line of duty. Suppose a fireman, an ENT, a policeman goes home from work and two hours later has a heart attack. Is that considered in the line of duty? So it, it, it's the chiefs have the ability to declare whether or not a passing is in the line of duty. Wouldn't that it, be more for physicians? If there's a, if there's a declaration of a, of a line of duty death, then if there is that declaration, the person will qualify for this. It so it's up to the chief to decide if it's in the line of duty. The, the, it could be two, three days later, but he could... Well, yeah, I mean, it, the chief declares it as whether it's a line of duty. The chief will weigh all the factors. If it's seven days later or six days later, you know, that might be something different. But it, it, it all revolves around is it an official declaration of, per, of passing in the line of duty? If I could just add, um, line of duty is, is defined in the proposed um, ordinance. And I'm going to read it to you. We didn't discuss it during our, our discussion, right, right. but I, I had a concern about one of the lines. I'm going to read it to you. It's not that long. Line of duty death means the death occurs while the firefighter or police officer is performing an action solely related to performance of the regular work or as part of it. It does not include deaths that could just have likely occurred while not on duty, travel to and from the place of business is not considered in the line of duty. Um, but I, I agree with your, your question about when, um, isn't that more for a doctor? Because this, this line, it does not include deaths that could just have likely occurred while not on duty. I, I don't know who makes that determination. Well, I, I I question the, the uh, expertise of the chief to decide that. That's why I mentioned it should be up to the physicians. All, all of the ordinance, sample ordinances that I looked at had that language in there with yeah. that um, does not include um, deaths that, again, that's really strange language that could just have likely occurred while not on duty. Um, one of the samples that I looked at did go on to say that heart and hypertension was not included, um, but that was just one out of the five I, I read. Um, so that is, I think, something for further discussion and certainly for discussion at the town meeting. Yeah, I mean, that's the purpose of the town meeting, that people weigh in on that. We're at the very beginning stages of the Sherman. It's going to go to the February meeting, as I mentioned, and then to a town meeting, so. Yeah, but but I I, um, I don't know why I didn't write that on my list, but I had a concern over that line, like who, who makes that determination? Yeah, that, that's uh, um, But um, because, anyway. You know, I'm, and please understand the way I'm saying this. I. I I really feel for the firemen. As a matter of fact, I got up in one meeting and I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do your job for all the money in the world. Right. Well, like I said, but, but I we know, yes. we know that we know that sometimes managers like to make friends of their employees, and they stretch the rules. So I, well, I just want to have it clear yeah. what is and isn't. That's I, I agree with you. That's why the line of duty is defined in our, the, the town attorney put that definition in our proposed <coughs> ordinance, and it's a, a matter for us to, to, to discuss it. Okay. 
Yes. The other thing I want to ask about the uh, the project on the Hartford Turnpike and uh, where they're doing the sewer. Where's that? Mm -hmm. uh, that pipe that. Oh, oh the uh, head wall. The head wall. Yeah. What's the, what's the price of that thing? They've been there for weeks almost. Yeah. Well, we bonded. Ten, Twelve men. Yeah. It's a very complicated project because yeah. the whole head wall had collapsed, and I'm trying to help you and the other neighbors over there by doing this so that we get an easier flow and there's no jam up and flooding over there. So I, I think it's somewhere around two hundred thousand dollars. This project. Oh, yeah. I kind of think thought it was over a hundred, hundred fifty. We've done a lot of work over there, Sherman. Oh, I know it. They, they, they have crazy. They've got all. You can't believe it unless you see it. Yep. Uh, did we get any help from the state on that, or the feds? Well, you know, um, I believe that was part of the package that we presented. I have to double check. So, yeah. Um, right now, the I th the answer is no. So, okay. yeah. Now we know that that's the North Haven Town Road, and I've asked about that. To yeah. Research it. Yeah. And if that were still a state road, would they be responsible for that? Well, because it, it's partially on Marlin, which is our road, and if that was a state road, I'm not sure how it would work. Um, so what I'd have to do is talk to the engineer to find out that wall itself that's being repaired. And for those that are here, those that are watching, a head wall is a wall, a concrete wall, where drainage comes from one road, in this case Marlin Drive, through the head wall, through a pipe, down in this case, in the back of, Sher of Sherwood Drive. And then it goes underneath Sherwood Drive, and the drainage goes out into where the Yale Healthcare facility is, into that area. The head wall is collapsing, which means that the pipe will be compromised. If that pipe were to be crushed, we'd have floods on Sherwood and floods on Marlin Drive. Yeah. Hartford so, Turnpike, Little And Hartford Turnpike, yes. Now that water actually, some of it originates up in Hampton and North Haven, up uh, in, uh, you know, like um, <coughs> Jennifer Drive area and so on. Yeah, so um, there's a detention pond up there, Sherman, yeah. and um, so the, a lot of the water comes down through the detention pond, down through Marlin, in the back, parallel to Hartford Turnpike, through the head wall, yeah. through Sherwood. I think that goes under Route 15. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think that... Uh, and please don't misunderstand. I, I do feel for the firemen and so on. And I I just I, I know when I was on the committee for tax relief, not not uh, tax abatement, but tax relief for seniors that had been in this town for many years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it was a, it was an actual fight. And we passed it by I think one or two votes one at the vote. town one vote at the right. town meeting. There were people that felt as though they didn't. They didn't want to help the seniors. People that were on Social Security making twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month. So, thank you. That was a close vote. I mean, that was very close. That yeah. vote, right? I know. I was one yeah. of the counters. Yeah. Mr. Tim Gabriel. Hello. Um, so I want to bring up something that I've been talking with Mr. Frieda about over the past year or so, but I'm not sure that it's ever um, been brought up publicly. And if it has been, I apologize, but I, I don't think it'd be a bad thing to um, Tim, just for the record, maybe mention your name and your address, please. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, sorry. Tim Gabriel, uh, 18 Renee Lane. Um, as the country has seen an uptick in activity from known white supremacists and hate groups over the past few years, so too has Connecticut. And unfortunately, so too has North Haven. And the latest apparently has seen a torrent of graffiti uh, plastered alongside the Tidal Marsh Trail connecting North Haven and New Haven. Folks out for a nice walk um, or a hike will now be assaulted with swastikas, Confederate flags, horrific derogatory words that I don't want to repeat, calls to violence, and recruiting materials for a certain hate group that I'm not going to give the honor of naming. Um, I think it's important to take this material in the spirit that it's meant uh, as a hostile threat to the peace and well-being of our community, and our welcoming community, that is. In the eyes of someone that this activity is intended to harass and intimidate, it's intended to be a signal that you are not welcome here. And it's not merely a blight or a nuisance, it's an open invitation to violence and one that we can't let linger. When I walk by or drive by something like this, it's as urgent as seeing like a small fire in the distance that's starting to take hold. 
The urgency is not that we need to shield people from knowing that stuff like this exists. Obviously, people know that this exists, that it's out there. The urgency is that we need to immediately combat the idea that this is who our town is, and this is what it allows. So these groups openly brag online about how their targets tend to be communities that were um, formerly predominantly white but experiencing demographic shifts, hoping that they will target disgruntled young, mostly men, to push back against the wonderful diversity that makes that the majority of us would welcome in our town with open arms. People of color, immigrants, LGBTQ folks, and others come to our community for the same reason that we want to live here. Great schools, great public services, a beautiful natural environment, all within a short distance to many cultural and historical locales. And when other towns, small towns, are struggling right now, ours is on the upswing. So I know our town officials are already doing as, like, a lot to make sure that this community continues to be a welcoming community. But I was wondering um, if you might be able to talk about a few things. I'm gonna ask all these questions all at once because they're, they're sort of related here. Um, what are the resources that are available to folks when they encounter something like this that does not belong in our town? Related to that, what should we as community members be doing? And what is the town's plan to prevent, combat, and respond to these incidents when they happen? Well, the town is already trying to combat it by denouncing it. We denounce all of this filth that Tim is talking about. Most recently, there was this filth on the North Haven Green. We removed it immediately because we own the property. In the beginning, Tim talked about the Tidal Marsh Trail. We don't own it, so we're, we don't have any responsibility for it. So we're, we're reaching out, and you've talked to Lynn Sadowski on this, she's been emailing you. We're reaching out to the um, Trail Association uh, who sort of um, administers this. It's not town property to see if there's something that they can do on this. And, and quite frankly, Tim, after I read the emails, I know you, Lynn's been your point person on this, I'm not even sure who owns the trail, uh, that, that property. That might be the people that Mary White's talking about uh, regarding uh, that project that Mary mentioned. If that's the case, it's a private property owner, we'd have to get them involved to clean it up. So, so the, trails, the trail filth that Tim is talking about, right now the town's hands are tied because we don't own it. We had it, and this is where Tim and I first started talking about this filth. Uh, it was on telephone poles on Route 5. So I've got a great relationship right up to the CEO of the UI. They said we can't touch the poles, but they will. So they went out. Some of the residents took the signs down. Uh, we haven't had a problem since. So three instances in this order. One was the telephone pole filth, which has been taken care of. We haven't seen it. Secondly was the filth on the green, which we took care of right away because we can control that. It's our property. And thirdly is this new development that Tim's talking about. The development meaning the development of all this graffiti, filth, and this vitriolic language that's seen down there. That's something that the town can't really handle right now because we don't own it. It's not our property. So I'm going to say publicly here tonight, we denounce it, we will combat it, and um, we're not going to tolerate it. That is our opinion. And that's, that is my philosophy here. If we see it and it's on our property, we will destroy it. Thank you very much for saying that. Like, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that's like the, the, the core lesson to take away from that. Um, you know, I know with UI, just from knowing folks that work with UI, they're incredibly short staffed right yes. now. Like, so getting folks out to like, for them to handle it is difficult, I'm sure, with our town. We have our share of our own issues getting people out to handle it. But I, th I think all of this, just, you know, what I said about the urgency of it, just is kind of the reason that I would like to see, you know, sort of like a long-term plan and maybe a list of resources that we can put online or advertise to folks of, ju of just like kind of the steps that they should take if they see something. Um, should they personally do something? Should they call? Who should they call? If it's private property, if it's public property, just kind of like the different scenarios yeah. that we sort of run through. So Tim, if it's, if it's public property, our property, call us. We'll take care of it right away. If it's private property, I'm not sure what the answer is. And, and maybe you could call us, and maybe what we could do is contact the private property owner and see if they would take it down. <laughs> On the UI polls, we know the answer to that. Even though we have a bucket truck, and I kind of offered that if they can't do it, maybe we'll send a bucket truck out there. They really don't want us to touch the poles. God forbid somebody gets electrocuted. Yeah. Um, that's that's a tremendous liability. Yeah. So, it's that's a, definitely been a concern. But it's not, and, yes. And I, 
you know, I definitely went out and took a few of those signs down. You did, right. I was sick of seeing them. Yeah. But it's, some of them were very high up. Right. They're on electrical poles and stuff like that. It's dangerous so, for people to just be taking that on. There. You know, after you reported that, Tim, I actually went out to that gas station that you report. I talked to the owners. And the owners, um, I said to them, um, you know, they're not from this country. They're uh, hardworking people in that gas station over there. And I said to them, I wanted to come out here personally to tell you that I've got your backs here. We are not going to tolerate this nonsense, this vitriolic and insidious and acrimonious language that we see here. So if you see anything happen again, you call me personally. They almost started crying. They were so delighted that I supported them like that. So we got a three-pronged three problem here, folks. One, we have a solution for. If it's on our property, we're removing it, no questions asked. We're not only removing it, we're destroying it as another symbol as how this government looks at that. On the private property, our hands are tied. But even through this conversation tonight, you see it, let us know. We'll pursue who we think can maybe handle it. And they tend to use telephone poles, as Tim is saying, with the first part of the story. In terms of when we first saw it, um, we will do everything we can with the UI to have them remove it. And that's how we feel about this. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Where, did, where is it on the title? Is it on some old, the old structure? I haven't walked it in a while. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Alex Johnson, 50 Fallon Drive. Um, actually, I am at least at that trail monthly, probably at least once a week. Right now, it was all over the sign that says um, North Haven uh, Tidal Marsh Trail, and he might edit some of it, I'm not. Um, there was a sticker that literally said, as you were saying, first selectman, because we want refugees and immigrants to feel safe here. Refugees not welcome, but the most disturbing part of that sticker was an image of a bunch of people piled up in a train and on the engine written, go back to Africa, which is very triggering to a lot of people, especially the black community, since that has been used at, since pre-Civil War as just a hateful remark. And we'll leave it there for simple reasons. Um, it's also on top of the two Brent benches which are within North Haven area. If you go further down when you get to the um, old railroad equipment, um, there's stickers that say white race. There is literally stickers telling people revolutionize, insurrect the government with extremely violent weapons on these stickers, which is very scary. Um, and then when you go further back, there is a tunnel, I believe it is. Right. It's probably an old, um, just an old <clears throat> way to prevent flooding. Um, there is graffiti that's, that was the biggest thing was that they had their website posted everywhere. They purposely did this for recruitment, not just as a hate crime, but to recruit. And I just wanna point out as someone who went to middle school here, went to high school here, a lot of the kids, if they have a free period, like they don't have fourth block, they go to Universal Drive, they go to the movie, they go get food at Chick-fil-A, they go hang out in Target, whatever, they go to that trail. God forbid that those people are back there and a student of color or a young kid goes back there alone, that is a very dangerous situation, especially since these people t seem to be very extremist pro-gun, not just like handguns, like full military grade. So I would ask the first selectman to not only have a plan in place, because even I've seen a cop and he's parked out front, maybe reaching out to whoever we find out is responsible, because you can access those trails without going into the target parking lot and there's no protection on that side so they could be sneaking in that way and that is a very dangerous situation or at least alerting parents and making sure that people are not going back there alone while this is going on that could be amtrak's property <clears throat> that you're mentioning now i know amtrak has had uh, police there they're, they're, they're amtrak police and they have um, they've moved people out that they've seen in the past so I think that might be something we have to contact Amtrak as part of uh, trying Amtrak to contain it. CSX. No, there's Amtrak. Uh, the, the, the CSX is on one side. There's Amtrak police okay. that patrol it. 
I think that tunnel might be owned by Amtrak. So. Because it um, goes into the railroad yard. Too. Yeah, it goes in the railroad yard. Actually, right. they have no so, trespassing signs right. posted there. there. So, so this it could is, be coming that direction too yeah, from right. the railroad. Yard. Also, I would advise that reaching out and letting the school principals know because their whole purpose is recruitment, and especially we don't want any kids being enticed by this, especially boys, and especially since they're literally saying revolutionize, like God forbid we ever had a school shooting in North Haven. This kind of stuff is very scary to have around kids, especially if a kid is unbalanced, not mentally healthy. We really need to let parents know so that they protect their kids to stay away from this. And then also for, for BIPOC, black, black, brown, indigenous people of color, and also other minorities that to take extra precaution as well for their safety. And then if I may make a suggestion and another way of combating this, Martin Luther King Day is coming up. Um, next month is um, African American History Month. I would highly suggest maybe the town, if it's possible, it's last minute, doing some event on the green. Something in show of support of the black community here and support of others as a way of not only just condemning in the paper and saying out loud, making a visual show of absolute the opposite of what these people are trying to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, Tom. Tom White, Summer Lane, and Happy New Year. I'm here to inform and advise of residents on Cindy Lane 1 through 30, Cindy Lane, Deborah Lane, and the uh, property owners closest to the parcel at 61 Quinnipiac Avenue to attend the Monday, January 8th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting at the library community room at 7 p.m. There is a public hearing scheduled for a zone change application changing the R40, CB20, and R20 zones on this parcel to elderly housing so that they can possibly overdevelop the property with multifamily housing. So these residents in this area would be affected and it's a possible four-story elderly housing complex that will be proposed. So I encourage all the residents in that area to attend the meeting and uh, get the information regarding this proposal so that they can have their voices heard uh, and get their questions answered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Mrs. Barrett. Good evening, Nancy Barrett, uh, One Crestview Drive, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone on the, on the Board of Selectmen. Um, so I'd like to start by just saying that I, I certainly support the proposed ordinance uh, for the abatement benefits to surviving spouses of those police officers and firefighters who are killed in the line of duty. Uh, of course, um, no one but the Board of Selectmen actually have the, at least the, the draft ordinance, so I, I can't really respond to the, to the language itself, but, um, but I do think that uh, in spirit, I'm, I'm certainly in support of this. And once it gets to the final language that is presented at the town meeting, I'd, I'd like to strongly encourage Mr. Frieda to present uh, a list of uh, the specific positions in the police department not just our own police department, but you also mentioned the, the uh, state police department, um, as well as um, firefighters uh, that, that are covered by this particular language, because I think it's, it's a pretty lengthy uh, list. And I think Bill brought up the point of, about the supernumeraries. I'm assuming that also the fire inspectors uh, and investigators would also be included in this list. So I, I think that that might be helpful for the, for the people in the audience. Um, and just to clarify, the, we did actually, uh, just to state the obvious, we did actually lose three emergency responders during the last 18 months, Dustin DeMonte, Maddie Wirtz, and Anthony DeSimone, and of course, 
you know, it, it remains to be seen the exact language of this uh, of this uh, ordinance as to whether this actually will apply to all three of them. But I think it's it's certainly worth uh, well, it's it's mentioning. only two that would apply. Only oh, two, only, only only two would apply. That's why I mentioned two. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the, the, my second point is related to the proposed uh, waste management project that uh, Mrs. White uh, alluded to. So I had a question about sort of the, the, the time sequence. Um, back in, I think it was June of this last year, I read something in the paper about a, um, that uh, the town of North Haven received a state environmental cleanup grant of about Four million dollars. Well, that's wrong. We did not receive it. The uh -huh. applicant received it. So, so it's not the town because, the in town. fact, the applicant owns the, this property. The applicant received the four million. It has nothing to do with the town of North Haven. Okay. So, do you happen to know because this was a, a brownfield remediation and development program um, that was obviously blessed by the by the governor? And, and in the article it said that it's already slated to become a waste reclamation facility and a carbon negative power plant. Of course, this is all a proposal, right. but I'm just wondering, is the grant contingent upon actually proceeding with this, pr this proposal? Well, it wasn't uh, part of the town, so. No, no, no I, yeah, I understand so. we're, we're not receiving right. it, but obviously we would be impacted and it seems to me, counterintuitive to have a four million dollar program to actually clean up a site of you know almost a hundred acres, only to then build this facility, which could potentially then contaminate the that that space again. So, mm -hmm. so again, it okay. seemed to me that doesn't make sense. And, that would be a question you can ask at the wetlands meeting. Okay. All right. And then uh, my third point, and again, it's, it's not even just inland wetlands, but also we, this needs to be approved by DEP, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to get some sort of feedback from, uh, from the person who is the representative of, of DEP as to whether this meets all of the criteria. Well, DEP is involved with the fill that Mary was talking about. Mm -hmm. DEP is sanctioning the fill to be moved over. So that's the question you might want to ask at the wetlands meeting. So that is a two-step process here. Mary, uh, Mary clearly laid out the two steps. Mm -hmm. The wetlands is for the fill permit and then planning and zoning. And we're years away, in my opinion, from them seeing a site plan approval mm -hmm. on that, or a site plan to approve it. I agree. But, so it's the first step. The most important step is to have the public ask the questions and as I said earlier the applicant Mr. Bill Gamberdell whom you know I do is is uh, is eager to answer any questions mm -hmm. during that meeting yep and and again I think that this is something that shouldn't just be an inland wetlands conversation but perhaps it should be a town meeting in which it's not it's not just opened up you know in that that venue which is probably going to be a very small room but perhaps at the high school in which many more people could attend. So just well, a suggestion. The meetings are posted, you know, people, everybody knows about this right now. Right. They may not have known it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, I anticipate a crowd at the wetlands meeting. Right. And then whenever, it, whatever happens at that meeting, if it gets to the point where there's a site plan in the next couple of years to go into planning and zoning, that'll be another publicly noticed meeting. I see. Okay. And then uh, the third point is related to the, the sale of uh, some of the vehicles that you mentioned uh, in, in the agenda. Um, in the past, at least with uh, police vehicles that have um, uh, that, uh, been, been put out to auction, I think that we have used the proceeds from those sales to offset expenditures, specific expenditures for the police department such as vehicle maintenance and repairs. So is that no longer going to be the case? Well, the money always is going into the general fund. And then internally, if there's an offset, the money has to go into the general fund, so. Well, I, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to recall uh, reports in which we would have negative numbers for an expenditure line just for this reason, because there would be money that would be coming in from the sale of some of these items, and it would be 
like in real time mm -hmm. offset. It, it could be offset. Yeah, okay. that, that's something yeah. we've done before. A, as right. opposed to going into right. the general fund and then we decide after the fact. Right. Oh, it, you know, what, it could what go either way. So to take place could work either way. Okay. All right. But as of this right. point, it will go into the directly yes. into the general fund. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your okay. time. I appreciate thank it. You. Al Warren. Al Warren, Charles Court. Uh, I think Mike knows why I'm here. No, I, 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 really, want, no, I, I really I don't. I really don't. So okay. fill us in. I spoke with uh, Lynn tonight, Sadowski, yeah. Yeah. at the uh, Open Space Committee. They don't get into what the problem I have with my property, okay? From what I looked up, field operations is responsible for maintaining the open space. Mr. Maturo seems to not think so. Oh, I know what you're referring to. And neither does Lynn Sadowski, by the way. See what? Neither does Lynn Sadowski. See, Al, now I know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm going to let you finish, though. Go right ahead. Okay. My property, it says here, enchants the value to the public abutting. My property abuts the open space. You know what my property is worth right now? Zilch. Maintain and enhance the vegetation and trees. Monitor and protect. Yeah, I don't know if everybody remembers the tornado we went through here a few years ago. I got two trees I look out my back porch that were uprooted, that are still there. Nobody has come out to take them, to fix it, or anything else. Now, on that property, water is coming in onto my property. I can't even cut the lawn in the back. If you go up there any day, any day of the week, water is running down in the swales. Now they said, well, we had an overabundance of rain this last year or the last couple of years. Why all of a sudden? Well, if you go up to the Hartford Turnpike and you look at the catch basins that are up there, that are on public property, they're, they're on the per people's property. They're not on the public, right? They're on the people's property. And water runs into these catch basins. I have a catch basin that's on Charles Court. When it was put in, that's the first catch basin, then goes across the street and down to Upper State. Why is there water running into that catch basin? There shouldn't be no water running into that catch basin. I know why the water is running into the catch basin, because when he built the house next door to me, everything was hooked up or all around the foundation and the downspouts to go to that catch basin. That was good, you know, good inspection by whoever was in charge to look at these houses before they were filled in around the foundations. But that was back then. But now it's now. And right now, nothing is being done. And I'd like to know why. Al, correct me if I'm wrong. We spent a lot of money helping you put curbs when Mike Matura was out there. Wait a minute, wait Hartford a minute. Wait, wait, did we hey, Mike, do how that? much did you spend, Mike? We spent a lot of time and effort with asphalt. How much does it cost for the asphalt curb? Three to six dollars a foot? But the labor, we spent a lot of time on that, Al. What do you mean you spent a lot so of time? So what, what is the Whose issue? Whose fault is it that the curb was out? Well, we, we repaired that for you. Okay. We repaired it. He was supposed to come up. I even called the Blight people, and they went up there and looked at it, and they called them, right? He was supposed to clean up everything that's on the other side of the guardrail. All down trees. They don't. The tree falls in Hartford Turnpike. They just dump it on the other side of the guardrail. Who dumped? They got to look at this. Who dumped? Who dumped it on the side? The public works. Oh, they, they're well. Don't uh, you know? I'm up there. I live up there. How, you, you mean to tell me somebody's going to stop the car and pick up a limb to dump it over there? There's down trees because of the water in, uh, coming into my the groundwater intruding onto my property now. Now I got trees on my property that are leaning. Right? And the trees that are leaning on the open space, too. Not only that, I just did, thank God the septic system. Oh, now you can, you can pump it out and it'll cost you 15 bucks. Oh, I wonder why. Why did you want to pump them out so much? Now I have water intrusion into the septic system. Okay? I'll take care of it. 
Don't worry about me. I'll take care of it. So, Al, what is it exactly you think you need there? Put a curtain train in. Well, we, we don't put, put one up at the, uh, up on King's Highway, up at back of those houses up there. And where does the water go? Goes into the catch basin with the little signal on it, the, little, the little stamp that says, this goes to the river, all right? What? Whoever put it in, that's not supposed to go into the catch basin. That's so, curtain drain. So you just said... So put, all that water comes down from King's Highway all the way down. But you just said put a catch basin in it. You just said put a curtain drain in. Put yeah. a curtain drain where? Put a curtain drain on your pro on the open space. But wouldn't that drain down even more into your property? Because you, no, you're no, on a 45 no. degree angle there, that hill, yeah, right? No kidding. So how, how else are you going to get rid of it? That's the only way to get rid of it, but a curtain drain. So the curtain drain has to be at least three and a half, four feet deep. So we put the curbs, public works, flushed, they, they cleaned the catch basin out. They did that the year Where's or two the catch ago basin? on Hartford Turnpike. That catch basin. They didn't right. put it in. That's that catch basin has been there all a long time. They cleaned it for you though, right? Didn't they? they did, why they, did they have to clean it? Well, I'm just asking. They, they did clean it for you, right? Didn't because you yeah, asked for it to be it. flushed it's out, a and they did. Twenty-four inch pipe. That that catch basin was never plugged. Right. So you did not ask to have it cleaned out? No, I didn't ask for to have the catch basin cleaned out. So what did Lynn and Mike say to you? These are the people that run Public Works, by the way. What did they say to you, Lynn and Mike? Maturo? Yes. He don't he don't answer my questions. Did you get a letter from Lynn Sadowski, or did you get the No, I'm not involved with it, Al. These are the people that handle this, okay? Wait, wait, so. wait, wait, wait a minute. Lynn called me up, and she met with Maturo up there again, okay. okay? And he said the same thing. This is what he said to her. I don't care. I put the curbing in, that's all I'm going to do, okay? So I told her I wanted that in writing. She said she could not give it to me in writing and sent it to your office. That was three weeks ago. I haven't heard nothing. So what is it exactly you want? You want curtain drains. Curtain drains. What else? Have the, town, have the engineer go out there and see what he says. But the water he, is coming onto my property. I thought he was out there. Haven't you met with the engineer out there? He was out there once. What did he say to you? He didn't say nothing. He never got back to me. Well, what did you, what did he, you had to have a conversation with him. He had to say something. No, no. He walked the property with, with Laura and Lynn. And w now, Laura's a zoning officer. What did they say to you when they walked the property? They said the same thing. They said, do you have a problem? And what did you say? I said, I said, well, the problem's got to be fixed. It's not mine. And what did they say when you said that? What? Well, they were look into it. All right, well. Well, you know, so. I don't know. We have it, it, it says right here, enhance the value to the public of budding, maintain and enhance vegetation and trees, monitor and protect. That's what protect from open space and from what building. the town is supposed to do. It's a budding property. I'll find out what to do next week when I meet with the EP. Okay. Okay. Now, with this, with thing with the police and firemen, as, as you know or may not know, I was a fireman for 30 years in the city of New Haven. What do you think about this, Al? I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Now, does the police and firemen have yearly physicals? Um, yes. Um, and that's something that's still work in progress on what the town can do more for that, to right. help that process. So, because that's a very key point, as you know, because you've served in New Haven, right? Yes, sir. So the physicals are very, very important. In fact, when I had my, when I was diagnosed with, with cancer, I had the uh, uh, people from Yale Occupational Health did my physical and background check, mm -hmm. so I could put in for for the cancer. And the how spot. often were those tests for you as a firefighter? For cancer? Out? Well, just in general, the physical. No, they wait until you get it. So did the city of New Haven have uh, workman's uh, comp? No, no testing for firefighters. Did they have it when the, you? The only it? testing that they did for firefighters in the city was the, the breathing test, where you where you actually blow into something, and it, it tests your the uh, blow the air power that comes out of your lungs. They can tell if your lungs are good or not. No. I see. Yeah. The, that they did that a yearly test. Mm -hmm. So you you will you support this then? I support it. You know. As long as it doesn't, it, it doesn't lead to some other thing like uh, 
you, you know, what if the guy has a, a is living in an apartment now or something like that, and then later on they get their property, that's when that'll become effective? Mm -hmm. Well, say that again, Al, I didn't quite understand. Say, that, say they're renting. Right. Would they get an abatement, say, and they buy a house? Or not they, who, the survivor buys a house. Will they then get that the same thing? Um, I don't think so, no. I think it says residence yeah, it has, at, the time. at the time. The language says residence at the time. Al. It's got to be a resident. Well, if you yeah. say they rented in Ortega, right. but, but then they buy a house afterwards. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No. Okay. No. So. But I, it's a good idea. Yeah. All right. It's just like with the, with me with the cancer bill. Now they just passed. Yeah. They put a five year five year limit on it. Didn't help us. Mm. Didn't help the the other guys. And believe me. Well, as you know, that was a very. I started out with twelve guys on Howard Avenue. Yeah. There's five of us left. Cancer. But that cancer bill that was a big. Um, a, a, a long process at the state level. Yeah. And we had Connecticut Conference, I mean, at municipalities, but I was the president at the time, so we supported that yeah. to try to help these firefighters. Um, but I understand your point. The heart hypertension, that was another one. Because right. you, know. you retired, what, 16 years ago? How many years ago? What, when I retired? Yeah. I, reti I was 68 to 98. Oh, so you're 25. I retired years. in 98, yeah. Right. But okay. I worked another 20 years at Spectrum Engineer. As a fire investigator, so, mm -hmm. but it, you know, the guys need it. It's it's a good it's a good thing. It is. I agree with you on that. But how now? The volunteers going to be the same thing? Yeah. Okay, so yes. So some of these things can be you know from the military side. You know, they just pass the Pact Act. Act and if you were at a certain location and you you have these illnesses, it's presumptive that you've gotten it from your service. So, you know, I think increasingly, you know, and you go back to all the firefighters that unfortunately have passed away after 9-11, you know, yeah. from the World Trade Center. Um, you know, I think it's pretty definite that they got it from the, you know, dust and asbestos contamination that happened after the, the towers fell down. So, yeah. so, you know, I, I, but, but, I mean, besides 9-11, 9-11 yeah. is, is different to what, you know, I know. It, it became a big thing with 9-11. But the thing is, this was happening to firemen Years ago, and you probably didn't before 9/11. They had a cancer bill. They didn't, right. that, was, that was doing nothing. Was doing My, nothing. You know, yeah, I have family members who were firefighters, but you know, you didn't have very good protective equipment going back to when you started. No, no, no. First in, no Scots. Yeah, I know. No, no. I was on yeah. Howard Avenue. Yeah. In the hill. That's mm. it. No Scots. That, that's different now. You know, I mean, when you used to ride on the back, you couldn't you couldn't ride on the back with a Scott air pack on. So. No. <laughs> okay. mm. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Al. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Mr. Katz. Sherman Katz, 40 Sherwood Drive. On this uh, project over at uh, Universal, will the Army Corps of Engineers be involved in that? Because anytime, I know on, um, uh, in, in, where uh, the game is, we were going to put a, um, a shopping center one time, a mall, and the Army Corps of Engineers came in and told us we couldn't build on the wetlands. Now, is this another situation? Uh, they could they could be asked to to weigh in, yes. So, so there's another, okay. And the last thing I want to bring up is, <clears throat> I, had two I have two neighbors on the street that used to feud. It, it was pretty serious at one time. And they would put up signs. Not very nice signs facing the neighbor. Well, the police came out and told them they had to take those signs down because in order to put up a sign in North Haven, you have to have the approval of the planning and zoning. So, then they went to J. Ruth, who used to have signs on the fence, and said, well, you have to take them down because you're not allowed. Is that something we could do with private property when you have signs up there? No, because with that, what well, you're referencing, Sherman, is 10 feet in from the curb. So, you, in other words, if you see a sign, uh, let's say it's a flag sign, and it's 10 feet in from the curb, that's, that's the town right away, then we have the right to take those down. So, but anything on private property. Well, these, these signs were 20, 25 feet into the people's property. Yeah, so the town can't do anything about that. But the police came out and told them they had to take it down. When was this? How long ago was this? 
I want to say about uh, 25 years ago. I mean, unless there was a harassment charge filed, maybe that's how the police... I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Because if there was a f memorialization of a harassment charge, then maybe the police would have the jurisdiction on that. Um, where one neighbor is feuding or, and harassing another. Then maybe that was part of it back then. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't see any more hands, so uh, motion to adjourn. A motion for adjournment. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. The preceding program is brought to you in part through a grant from the town of North Haven. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at nhtv.com.